So here I would like to begin working on the back plane itself. This is the pro back plane. It's nice. I like it. There is no printed documentation that came with this that I saw, but um, there is documentation online on how to put each and every one of these parts together. Uh, the modules are sold separately. In the pro kit, you kind of get a base set of modules. So they are also documented separately and they are packaged super well. Oop. Some of these are for uh, modules themselves, I think. If I get the back plane put together, I can actually test it right away with um, the cards from the original here. I should be able to take all these out, put them in here, and have it work as though nothing has changed. So I think what's going on is, from what I've read, the uh, RC2014 extended bus is really only these pins here, and these additional four optional user pins that we get access to. Uh, you can see the labels here. This is the normal um, RC2014 bus. So you see the address lines, ground and power, M1 reset, all the control logic, the data lines themselves, and I guess serial. Um, but then you see over here, the extended bus, you get access to all these lines as well, which gives you more capabilities to do advanced computing using interrupts and such what. Um, but then what I understand here is that these four pins on the original bus, these four here that are unlabeled, are user pins, meaning we can tie them to whatever we want to tie them to. If there's a reason to tie them back into the existing bus, somehow we can. If we're adding peripherals, we can use those lines for, we can use these lines basically for whatever we want. And I think these additional four are also optional. However, we do want all of these pins available if we want to use something like the Z180, the successor to the Z80, because I think those are typically used for uh, the additional address lines. Now, what that means is these are the correct length here for the standard bus. These are, these are potentially optional, and they are the correct length for the extended bus. However, these additional four optional ones, we may have to source our own, our own uh, pins for. Which I have plenty. So I thought I recorded it, but I actually just took a, a single still photo. <laughs> what I did was I took my existing stash of these things, single female DuPont connectors, I guess, and I cut out a template based on the extended bus length that I needed, and I put it in here like that, and then I used this guy 
and I just cut everything down. I cut 12 of those out, and now I have everything in place uh, to access the entire um, extended bus for this system. Now, on every, on every slot, on all 12 inputs. And what I found online was that you can take these and lay them across to make them stay in place. It's just a tip that some other builder had had written out. Now I'm taking it apart because I noticed this one's still this one's crooked and I don't want that to be crooked. The idea here is that these ones will hold these ones in place such that uh, we won't get anything crooked or falling out when we flip the device over to start to do soldering. So let's see if we can get these in line, uncrooked, stay in place. You may notice some jagged edges here where I use the tool to brutally savage these things into shape. So that's not working for me. So instead we're not we're not gonna use that method. And all right, so I figured it would be less tedious and frustrating just to do it one row at a time. So whatever, we will just get these on here and then start soldering. Um, I will probably speed up this process a little bit and I'll try to keep everything in frame, but uh, sometimes I get distracted by just focusing on it. tip I want actually but it's already heated up so let's see how it does. So because I am impatient, I am firing up my new Heinzel portable soldering iron, which I've used a little bit and it's pretty nice. Uh, I'm just waiting for my main soldering station to cool down enough for me to put a different tip on it. But for now, we'll use this one. It heats up slower than the station itself and it doesn't keep a consistent steady temperature like I would like but I am running it off of a battery pack that probably does not provide a high enough voltage in fact when I just turned it on right now it's a DC low so I probably need a more capable battery pack to power it off of but it's getting up to temp That's pretty crooked, but we can straighten it out now.
really well. Uh, it's working great for me right now. Uh, to turn it off, I think you just press both buttons. I'm going to switch back to my other iron now, though. Okay, we're back. We've got another row here ready to go. Oh, this is still heating. Wow, the portable unit uh, so far was working better than this one is. Wow, very different. Huh. Okay. Well, uh, I might not use this soldering iron anymore. We're switching back to the old, actually working portable unit. You see low it said, the battery pack I'm running it off of is fully charged. So I'm back with this one. It solders so much faster. I've already done a few joints here. It definitely seems to be working better than my full-blown workstation, solder workstation. It is a cheapy one. I got it for maybe 80 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. So, uh... Maybe it's not the greatest, but it's what I've soldered with so far on this channel.
looked at that just now. Looked at that real good. I'm gonna have to fix that somehow. Woo! That was a mistake. Oh, that sucked. Be careful with your tools. I'm waving around willy nilly. Gonna damage the equipment. see what I can do about this melting I just did over here because that sucks it's fine I just needed to dig out the holes a little bit it's a, just a cosmetic problem but I'll try to avoid doing any more of that I really just want to get all these things on here so I can avoid any further mishaps like that. Just need to stop waving this around like a madman.
Oof, I'm gonna take a break. Okay, I'm back from taking a break. I haven't soldered them all in yet. Okay, these ones need to be attached still, these three. So we'll see if we can get them attached, and then we'll solder it up the rest of the way. Nope. All right. Fumble, fumble, fumble. All right, we'll keep doing it the way we have been. So the lesson here is, uh, honestly, just do it one at a time. Get them in there, get them on there, and then solder them up. see me go back and reheat up a joint I just finished that's just in case I feel like it did not uh, heat up the pad and the pin enough to solder a solid joint you get what's called a cold joint that looks connected but uh, does not have a consistent or reliable connection And you can usually tell that that happens because the solder will look more like a bubble than like a, a pyramid or like a little tower, a little cone rather. But you can also get connected joints that look like a bubble if you use just too much solder as well. Of course, I use lead-free solder because leaded solder gives me the worst headache and also, you know, environment reasons or whatever. I would actually prefer leaded solder in most cases because it is specifically resistant to a type of crystallization that can cause shorts, uh, where these, the solder itself will grow little hair-like structures out of it. I may have talked about that on camera before, but, uh, Apparently leaded solder is resistant to that, and that's the biggest reason it was ever adopted in the first place, is to reduce shorts and problems with electronic circuits that are caused by that. But uh, lead is terrible for the environment or whatever, and I, it gives me a terrible headache. I cannot work with it, even with like a big mask on, filters on it, it, I still get the headaches. And that's with a fume extractor, which this is not the best fume extractor in the world. It doesn't move the air outside of the house, which is what you really want. It just kind of filters it.
but it's what most people are going to be working with is something like that, if at all. I used to just have a little dollar store fan on my desk. I blew the air away, but my girlfriend hated it and she got rid of it, and I don't know why she hated it so much. But it's a done deal, it's gone. These are done, these are done, these are done, these are done, these are done. These are done, these are done. Okay, so we just need to do all the long ones that are left. I absolutely love this soldering iron. I cannot get over how much I like it. It is only $25 right now. If you do not have one, you should get one. Especially if you're looking for an entry level kit that you wanna be able to rely on in a professional capacity. Like my first entry level soldering iron was a little iron that you just plugged into the wall and it had a little dial on it and I just kind of got it because it was about 20 bucks and it had some tools with it and some solder and it was enough to know whether I wanted to actually get good at this or not and of course I did want to get good at it and I'm still not good at it because I you only see me do through whole components so far so one day I'll get good at it though. But if you need an entry level model, uh, I mean $25, if you end up not liking the hobby, you could give it away. Whereas if you get another entry level one like I got, you're gonna throw it away. You're not gonna keep it. Even if you like the hobby, you're not gonna use that soldering iron for very long, you know? But this one's really good. And it doesn't maintain a consistent temperature, but as far as experienced soldering, it is consistent. Like, it doesn't matter that the temperature is kind of changing on me. You see how well it solders. Oh yeah, my whole point of bringing up lead-free versus leaded earlier was that uh, lead-free solder so far for me has been harder to work with. I know a lot of you might know that already. A lot of you might be working with it already. Um, I'd say it's worth working with, but sometimes I find myself frustrated because I used to be able to do things like just reheat and repair. Oh, there's a, I closed that hole up right there reheat and, and repair solder joints that I did poorly very easily and now I kind of get to this point with lead free solder where sometimes you you just need to put new solder on there do your best to remove what's there because it will not reflow old solder the same way that that leaded solder seems to work Look at that, I've closed up two holes here. I need those for capacitors, but we'll deal with that 
when the time comes. I know what happened is I'm not cleaning my tip enough. So solder builds up and then it touched this joint and it touched this joint or through hole rather. And some of it, it flowed onto the hot metal from the soldering iron. So that's one reason to make sure you keep cleaning your tip there. One, two, three, four, five, six. It might be break time again. So I feel like this video is becoming uh, just a showcase of how much I like the pine sill uh, portable soldering iron. And I, <laughs> for good reason, I have taken a break. It's been more than a day uh, since I stopped and I played with this more and as long as you set it right and plug it into the right cords uh, give it enough voltage outright uh, from this thing I can get 12 volts which is sufficient to, to run it but I was plugged into this USB port uh, and it was giving me 9 volts out of that which is not sufficient but it still ran and that's why I was having that trouble with uh, with the temperature not sustaining itself and it was kind of slow to heat up but now that I've got it set up correctly and you can see I've changed it gives me more details about the temperature and stuff here um, the input voltage actually says it's 15 right now um, I have it configured to operate at 12 though uh, but watch watch it heat up now I just got done talking smack and it's gonna take its time now Oh, there it goes. You know, that's significantly faster, and I've been using a Seality uh, workstation for a while, and it, while that one displays that it gets up to temp faster, it takes longer before it's actually usable. This one, even when it's like at two something, I can solder with this lead-free solder. Uh, so I like it. In fact, I ordered another one and I ordered a clear plastic shell for this one and I ordered the fine tips, which maybe will help me with my surface mount component uh, projects that I'm not doing very well with because I don't have any fine tips, quite frankly. All right, so we're gonna finish putting these headers on and then um, Hopefully we will then figure out what else needs to be soldered onto the board because so far I haven't looked at any of the documentation. I just know that these headers go here. So uh, I'll actually have to do some research to figure out what parts to put elsewhere. Once that's done, we will then uh, plug in the old computer parts from our trusty sidekick who is elsewhere than they should be right now, the original RC 2014 and just see if we can fire it up because this backplane is compatible with that configuration and I should just be able to run the computer as I always have after plugging it into this backplane. So that'll be a good first test to see if I broke anything here. All right, let's get back to it.
Whoa. Whoa, Nelly. I am literally filming on an iPhone on a, uh, a tripod that is, in fact, a uh, selfie stick slash tripod that I have between my legs. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is top tier content production. You know, it's, if you want to know how the pros do it, this is how the pros do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, no doubt. This is so relaxing. At least when it's going well, right? Uh, we'll see how relaxing it remains when I get to something complicated. So I will say that this particular uh, style of portable uh, soldering iron is not new and it's not unique to uh, Pine 64. I found another one just today that I was looking at. Uh, not that I need more than two of these things, one for backup really. Um, that it uses an STM32. In fact, this, the RISC V processor in here is uh, designed to be essentially the equivalent to the chip that that I saw on the other soldering iron. So it's pretty it's pretty ubiquitous. You don't necessarily need to go out and get this one to have this experience. There's other companies out there with products very similar to this. Apparently it's a, just a new way of making soldering irons with a smart power delivery that lets them be this super lightweight and run off of a battery pack and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, this is, don't think that this is the only way you can experience this type of freedom. Uh, the tips in here are T100 tips, which are a universal standard. You can find them easily, so you don't have to worry about um, getting locked into a vendor or something like that. Uh, and I have replaced my, I mean, I packed up my soldering iron. I, I had this soldering iron workstation that I like, and it's good, but it's given me trouble before and it gave me some trouble that this one it has not given me and I have switched. It is my new standard for now, which I did not expect to happen.
doing a lot of checking the first pins that I tied down just to get the thing in place because there's a good chance that I didn't really flow those correctly. But here's one that needs a little love. There we go. Uh, let's hit you. And you a little bit. Okay, I think we're good. Alright, I am going to scrub this with a little alcohol, get all this XX, excess flux and such what off of it, and then we'll figure out what's next. So I made a cascading series of mistakes when I went to clean this board up. Um, it just had a little like flux and some solder balls on it. This solder jumps everywhere as you're working with it, makes a bit of a mess, but I went to grab this brush, which I could not find, and uh, so I grabbed another brush, and I did not realize that that brush was very dirty, and it, uh, so I start, I put alcohol on the back of this thing, just rubbing alcohol, I started brushing it, and I realized belatedly that I was just depositing gross gunk onto the back of the board, and in fact it damaged it a little bit. It, remove some of the solder mask here which I covered with some nail polish uh, and then of course after that I made the mistake of uh, touching up a few of these joints noticing that this was shiny forgetting that I had put nail polish nearby it and then trying to clean up this joint even though it didn't need it and of course it reacted with the nail polish and you can see it actually you might be able to see that there's a black mark where the nail polish uh, uh, burnt up. So I had to like work with this joint until I burned off all the nail polish and then hopefully came close to burning the pad off, I think, lifting the pad up. And, uh, it was just a mess. So it's, it's kind of messed up because I made it filthy and then had to clean it up from that. And it's actually about as dirty as it was to begin with, but I think I got all the major flux off. There's fibers from a paper towel still that I, for some reason in a panic, wiped the back with, even though I knew what would happen if I touched a paper towel to these pins. Anyway, I eventually found my brush and, actually I didn't even find it. I, I took this off of my toothbrush. It needed a new head anyway, so I, I replaced that, but blah, 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 blah. Yeah, uh, don't be like me. Learn from my mistakes. I make these mistakes so you don't have to. So some of you may have noticed that there are these rows here that are unpopulated. And if you look close, you can see there are exposed uh, traces between these and the goal of this is to give us two places where we can isolate the standard bus it doesn't affect the extended bus we can isolate the standard bus on these two sockets and on these three sockets uh, by cutting traces between here and they give us through holes here so that in case we need to cut the traces and then put uh, resistors or diodes in there to facilitate any prototyping we're doing where we might want to have more control over how electricity flows across the bus to our devices. So that's pretty cool because we have a lot of flexibility here. Now I have gathered the rest of the parts we need. Um, we need some of these footprints on here are optional. This one's optional if you want to power it a certain way. Uh, the documentation I read makes it sound like I need to have a jumper here in order to power it through uh, the um, barrel connector. Uh, but we have a barrel connector, a switch. We also have a terminal block here to power it from. Maybe the jumpers for this. I, I wasn't clear. The documentation for this board is actually pretty slim, which is 
weird because all his other stuff is very thoroughly documented. But uh, yeah, we have a little power light, uh, reset switch, and I don't know whether it's optional to put it on the clock module like it was with the original or not, but I have a clock module with one on there, so uh, I'm just gonna solder it directly here. We want to make sure we're putting the right value resistors in the right places. I already measured these. I'm not good at reading the color bands. It's, I'm not colorblind or anything. I just, I'm not good at it. So um, I just usually use a multimeter and measure them before I do anything. Uh, so this is the 2.2K and this is the 330 uh, ohms. So let's get it in there. We also need to put these capacitors on the power lines here. Um, yeah, the, the rest of this should be easy peasy. here real quick. If I were to put this optional component and a couple of capacitors for it into here, then I could plug in higher than a five volt um, input source and it would step it down to five volts so that's what these optional components are for should have done this part first Be 
real careful trying to do it that way because you can very, very easily burn yourself. Sweet action. that you're supposed to clip these before you solder them because if you don't it can cause the solder to break or crack when you saw when you clip them but um, I never notice any difference I do it both ways and I'm always trying to compare and so far it has not seemed to matter so uh, we're going to clip these ones afterwards because it would be less of a hassle. And if we have to reflow solder, we will reflow solder. Here it is all hooked up with the original classic full Monty kit. It looks so sparsely populated compared to what it did on this board. And of course I can still use this back plane for various things, so that's fun. Um, I'll get some footage of it running. Uh, let's do see if it powers on with the supplied barrel cable. Power. Power. So if my original understanding of the documentation is correct, I may need to put a jumper here. Let's see what happens. Yup, no power. Let's see. Take the jumper off the old board. Pop it onto direct and ta-da! 
Whoops, wrong. We forgot one additional component. Uh, the resistor for our reset switch here. Now I can reset it with this switch. I want to reset it with this switch, so. That's bad. That's a bad solder joint. One more time. See, and that's what I'm talking about with the difference between uh, how forgiving leaded solder and lead-free solder are. If that had been leaded solder, I would not have had to remove that. It would have just reflowed and been fine the first time. Um, so you get less kind of room for error with lead-free solder, but no headaches. So at least for me. So, all right, done, done and done, actually done. That'll keep the reset switch pulled too, too high. It'll keep it pulled high because when we pull it low for at least seven cycles on the Z80 specifically, uh, that's when it actually resets. All right, now let's do this.